Come with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. Stewardship is a matter of the heart. Now to help us get the big picture of this morning's sermon, I'm going to share with you three very important pointers in what I would call the biblical context. The biblical context simply means the big picture. We don't have the privilege of time uh, to be able to do a thorough study of those three chapters of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But we will have time just to look at a little segment of the Sermon on the Mount. But the three pointers I'm going to share with you in the beginning of the presentation will provide the frame. And so when I talk specifically about this little snapshot of what Jesus told the disciples, you will appreciate it more because you've got the big picture. Three pointers about the context. This will appear on the screen and you will want to write this down. According to Matthew, I'm starting now with chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. While it is true that there was a multitude of people, there was a crowd, there was a mass of a people present on this occasion when Jesus talked about what is now recorded in chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, fact of the matter is, his primary audience meaning the very people he wanted to connect to, the very people he wanted to impact, was not the multitude, but the 12 disciples. That is important. And so the Sermon on the Mount was a special presentation, not for the Mass, but specifically for the 12 disciples slash followers of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, church, I take that your presence, your presence here this morning will tell me that while this is the 21st century, you two have made the decision to be a disciple and follower of Christ. Am I correct? And so what you read in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is also a message from God to you. Because it was a presentation specifically for his followers. Second observation of the context. We're still with chapter 5, but we're looking specifically at verse 3 to 12. Bible commentators and all of us would call this section of chapter 5 the Beatitudes. Simply mean... Jesus' blessings, his blessings. But let me open a little window and give you something which will make these blessings so significant for us this morning. After Matthew gives us the setting and points us to the audience, which in this case, the 12 disciples, immediately, and I'm looking at the structure of this piece of literature, the very first thing that Jesus did on this occasion was to bless the people. I want to make that point again. The very first part of his presentation on this occasion was a blessing for his followers. Blessed are the pure in heart. Bless you, bless you, bless you when they persecute you. And make all kinds of accusations because of me. For great is your reward in heaven. Then following, following the blessings come the expectations for the disciples. What am I saying? You see, the way God works is that he will bless us first. Before he calls us into a hard commitment to him, he first blesses us. Let me illustrate. 
In my travel around the world in the last quinquennium, the last five years, and as I talk to people about the principles of Christian stewardship, and then I ask a few of them this question. And I've asked this question of many of our people around the world. Here's the question. Why do you return a tithe? Now, if I take a sampling of 10 Seventh-day Adventists around the world that I've asked this question too, why do you return a tithe? Hear me on this one. Seven out of a ten will tell me, because I want to be blessed by God. A very noble desire. So I ask, ten, seven out of ten will tell me, because I want to be blessed. Wrong. That is not the motivation why we return tithe. We return tithe and we are able to return tithe because God has blessed us already. No, you didn't get that one. We return tithe because we have been blessed already by God. And consequently, we are able to return tithe and give offerings of gratitude because we have been blessed first. If the returning of tithe is done because we are looking for a blessing, that is bribery. We cannot bribe God. We return tithe because he has blessed us already in Christ. Even before you came this morning to return the Lord's tithe, the fact of the matter is you were blessed. He gave you life. He gave you safety and security on the road. Blessings come first. His blessings precede his call for us to do something for him. It's not the other way around. Going back to a passage of study for this morning, God's blessings precede a heart commitment to him. The rest of the three chapters, depending on your preference, if you want to use just one word to sum up the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, that one word could be discipleship, the life of a disciple. Remember point number one, who was he talking to? The disciples. What you find in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is Jesus' call to the original 12, to a life of a follower of his. Now let me make some other suggestions that will help you in your understanding of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to suggest to you, in terms of the chronology of the public ministry of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, though you find it early in Matthew, actually took place very late towards the end of the three and a half years of his ministry. That's important. This was not a call in the beginning. This was a call towards the end, when the disciples were ready to go out and change the world upside down for Christ. Here's another observation which will assist you in looking at this passage of Scripture. In terms of the time of the year, this was the springtime. This was a time when wildflowers were, were coming out in the field. And that's why when we get to chapter 6, for example, he talks about grass of the field, flowers of the field, he talks about birds. It was springtime and there was life everywhere, as it were. Three pointers. This is the frame. Now we'll look at the picture. Primary audience, the disciples. Blessings precedes a hard commitment to God. This sermon, it's about discipleship, or if you opt for two words, Practical Christianity, how to live a life of a Christian in the world. Again, because of time. I know you want me to preach the whole afternoon and tomorrow and uh, next week, but we've got to have lunch sometime. And with all those curries, um, we've got to get there. So let me fast forward, take you now to chapter 6. That's where we're going to uh, stay for this morning. 
Let's go to about the middle of chapter 6 to the end of chapter 6. And at the end is where we pick up our scripture reading for this morning, verse 33. So now it's chapter 6, about the middle. I want to leave with you today, I want to leave with you today, five biblical truths that Jesus wants us to learn as his disciples. How many truths? You're good students. I like this class. Five. All right. Let's go to the Word of God. My use of the NIV, a number of reasons. But particularly in worship, I want young people to be part of it. Um, other reasons, but that's, that's why. I, I could use any other version of the Bible. But for this instance, we're going to use the NIV. Again, for uniformity, I'm going to invite you, and I like the fact you, you want to participate in the worship. So we're going to read together from the NIV. Again, we're going to the middle of chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Are you ready to read with me? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Question, what is Jesus saying? What's the point? Well, let's look at these two verses. First thing that you'll see is the fact that Jesus repeats this clause, store up. For those of you who were here last night, in speech and in writing, if a concept or word is repeated more than once, it means it is important. You're good students. I like this. I think I can come back to this classroom sometime in the future. Store up, Sir Jesus. What's the point? Here's the point. Truth number one. How many truths are we learning this morning? Five. Here's number one. Write it down. As you write, others will read. So let's read. For those of us who are not writing, let's read together. Here's truth number one. Financial saving for the future is good stewardship. But investing with God in his mission on earth yields better interest and dividends. What do you say? Let me break up that truth into two parts. In fact, there are two parts to this truth. Contrary to what you may have heard, that you don't need to save in this world because we're going to heaven. That's not true. Jesus, in the verses that we've looked at, is saying it is okay to save. It is okay to invest. Putting aside a few dollars for tomorrow, for the children's education, for the children's clothes, for a house and a car, that is okay. I remember when I was studying at Loma Linda University, I'm talking now of the late 80s. And I, I, I was blown away when I heard some of my, my friends uh, whom we were doing graduate studies at the same time, they were saying, well, we, we're, we're planning, my family's planning to move to somewhere in the country. Um, we've got to get away from this place. And we don't want to spend money having a, a nice car and, and, and uh, uh, a house because Jesus is coming soon. I remember many, many years ago, my, my father is now resting, waiting for the resurrection. My father was also an evangelist, and in, in my part of the world, the South Pacific, there was a particular elder of the church. You see, when my dad preaches about the second coming, and I recall myself many times as a child, I would be sitting next to my mother. I come from a family of eight boys only. We adopted two girls. We wanted to have girls in the family, so we adopted two girls from the mission field, but there are eight of us, so you don't want to mess with me. I have guys that will take care of you. Uh, but uh, here's my point. So, so dad had in his church, uh, in the early part of his ministry, this elder. So, uh, you know, he, he preaches about the, the second coming. Yes, I was talking to him about sitting next to my mom uh, on a number of uh, evangelistic programs. You see, that's why my little son wants to, to come up. He wants to preach. Uh, and I got to tell him, wait, wait your time. Let me, let me do my thing, you know. But, but very often I would say to my mom, I said to my mom, Jesus is going to come before daddy finishes his sermon. <laughs> because my dad is so passionate about the second coming. And then he had this elder who came in and said, well, Pastor Puni, I'm not going to go and plant any more crops. 
because Jesus is coming soon. And my dad told him, listen, even if he's coming tomorrow, you still need to go to the farm and plant some more crops. Let me go back to the point of our presentation this morning. It is okay to save and invest for a good car, for a nice sari, for whatever you're thinking about for the future. That's quite okay. But there's a but. But investing with God in his mission here in this world will yield better returns. Let me expand uh, on this by looking at this next point. Uh, moving now to point number two. Again, we're looking at the Word of God. Following verse, we're picking from 19 uh, to 20. Here is 21. I've highlighted the word heart. Heart. Uh, in bold letters. Let's read the text together. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now take verse 21 and 20 and 19 together and we ask the question, what is Jesus saying? What is his point? Well, he's talking about the heart. He's talking about the heart. In fact, he's not talking about money, contrary to what we've just said or observed. The point of 19, 20, and 21, it's about the heart. Now, I've got to tell you that Jesus, Jesus is a master teacher. And let me pick up on just one part of his teaching technique. Now, I, I am also a teacher, or was a teacher, though I continue to teach in the field. But Jesus was a master teacher. Jesus was a champion of contrast. So when you read the gospel, he'll say something like, I, you say this, but I say. And even in this passage, he, he uses and harnesses the power of contrast in, in, in a very, very deep way. Look at the screen. Let me see if I can simply illustrate the, the mastery of Jesus using this teaching technique. So in 19 and 20, he talks about do not invest on earth, he said, because, but invest in heaven. You see this idea of contrast. You see, for Jesus, to invest on earth, your investment is at risk. I don't need to tell you what happened a couple of years ago, and, and we're still feeling the impact of the so-called financial crisis. You may have millions of billions of dollars and all of that wealth can disappear overnight. When the market crashes, your wealth disappears. So Jesus is saying, don't put all of your eggs into one basket. Because here in this world, there are all kinds of variables. And your investment is at risk if you put everything here on earth. So he said, but invest in the bank of heaven, because I will be the manager of your portfolio. I will take care of things. And so your investment is secure. Jesus is talking about the things of the heart. Again, the rest of chapter 6, he said, you see, the problem with investing only on earth is that the rewards are temporal. But if you invest with me in the bank of heaven, the benefits are eternal. Do you see how Jesus works these contrasts beautifully? One of my favorite aftershave balm, you know, to splash in my face after I shave, is one by Calvin Klein. It's called Eternity. I like Eternity because I believe in eternal life. Though I can splash my face in the morning and the nice smell disappear in the afternoon. But I think you get the point. With the things of heaven, they are forever. They are forever. With the things of this world, you know this, everything in this world revolves around money. 
It's money, it's money, it's money that makes the world go around. We'll get there. But that is true. Things of this world is about money. But the things of heaven, it's about God. But the third point, I will talk about money and God. You see, what Jesus was doing as he was teaching was looking the disciples in the face and he was saying, where's your heart? I mean, I say to you, sitting here, this is the seventh day. This is a day of worship. But is your heart here or is your heart already on the things of Monday and Tuesday next week? Where is your heart? Well, the things of this world, and we'll get there. We'll get to, to some of these concepts. Jesus said, it comes with worry and anxiety. I have friends, business people, well-to-do people. They're not Adventists. Some of them are not Christians. And they tell me, when we talk about our profession, they say, Pastor, you're better than us. Because when we sleep, we're not really asleep. We're thinking about how to make a profit tomorrow. But you can sleep. We don't need to worry about those things. The things of heaven, it's not about worry. It's about faith. Do you trust God? Or are you worried? Interestingly, and again, I'm simply trying to pull out some of these things that Jesus is talking about here in the last part of chapter 6. Jesus is so straightforward. He said to the disciples, he said, if you're going to subscribe to what I have on the left of the screen, he used, in the King James Version, a very strong word. He said, you're a pagan. If you're thinking only of investing in this world, if your life is about money, you are a pagan. Now, I'm a nice guy. I, I want to be gentle with my audience, so I've opted for a gentler word. The word is unbeliever, but it means the same thing. If you're about money, then you are not a believer. You're a pagan. If you're about God, if you're about faith, if you're about the things of eternity, you're a disciple. Powerful. But Jesus uses this technique to make a point. Make up your mind. Where is your heart? So here is truth number two. Truth number two. Let's read together. It is natural for the human heart, mind, by the way, to focus and follow what it perceives as important in life. I was in the city of Ulaanbaatar, capital of Mongolia, a couple of years ago. The church is young but vibrant. And I was called in to teach our young team of workers, about 50 of them. And I remember the Sabbath, all of our members came together to the central church there in Ulaanbaatar. And as I was looking down to the audience, I, I could see there were a couple of people that I felt didn't quite belong to the audience, or at least to that part of the world. And so at the door, as I was shaking people's hands as they were leaving that worship, these two white boys stepped up. So I said, uh, where are you from? What are you doing here? And uh, one guy said to me, well, we were here about three years ago. We were uh, Adra workers. The other guy said, I'm from Perth in Australia. Anything about Australia? I said, oh, well, interesting. So why are you here? Both of them said, well, we finished our contract with Adra. But in the course of our work with Adra, we, we met this beautiful girls from Mongolia. I said, well, continue. Then one guy, the guy from uh, Canada, the guy, the guy from Canada said, well, a few months ago I married. I married the, the girl that I met. And then I said to the guy from Australia, so, mate, uh, what are you doing here? And he said, well, in a couple of weeks' time, I too will marry to the girl that I met a few years ago. And I come to, to accept the truth that I've just shared with you. Your heart will normally 
follow where you perceive to be important in life. If it's your wife, it doesn't matter where she goes in this world, you're going to follow her because that is the most important thing in your life. If it's money, it's going to be the same. You will keep on working seven days of the week because it's about money. So the principle is this. It is very natural for the human heart, the human mind, to focus and follow what it perceives to be important. If God is God, if God is your value, as I've said last night, guess what? Who will you follow? God. Let's continue our study. Verse 24. 24. Uh, let me ask you to uh, read together with me on the screen. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and... Now, that's one reason why it's better to use the NIV than the King James Version. Because if you're reading this verse in the King James Version, it reads, you cannot serve both God and mammon. So who's mammon? It's money. It's money. Again, we ask the question, what's the point? But let me, let, me, let, let me make an observation. If a word or a concept appears more than once, a piece of literature, or you hear it in a speech, it means it is important. So guess what? What's the word that appears twice? Sir. Now let me add another two more words, and then I'm going to pull them together to suggest to you what I think Jesus was saying on this occasion. Service or to serve is important to Christ. Love is important. And I take you to what we read last night from Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Here's another word. The word is devotion. You pull in the word serve, you pull in the word love, you pull in the word devotion, you'll get the English word worship. And here's my point. Jesus is not talking about money. Jesus is using money to illustrate the point, but the point is worship. Are you with me, church? Jesus is talking about worship. In fact, in the verse that we've just read, verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6, for our online viewers, Jesus was asking the disciples the question, whom are you worshiping? And then he uses again the power of contrast. He is implying, are you worshiping money or are you worshiping God? Money, ladies and gentlemen, is a means of worship. And so when you read in Scripture, both the Old and New Testament, when people come to the sanctuary, when people come to the synagogue, when people come to the temple, guess what? They would bring with them the Lord's tithe and an offering. Money is a means of worship. What about God? But God is the object of worship. Where we get into trouble is where we are confused about the means and the object. God will always be the object of worship. Money is a human product. People created it to help us live our lives in this world. But God, He is the creator. He has no beginning and He has no end. Would you worship something that was made? Or would you worship the creator of the universe? Money. Again, I want you to hear me very clearly this morning. Money is not evil. Money is a gift of God. It is the want of money that is evil. But money is a gift of God. It enables us to do the business of God, the mission of God in the world. It is a gift. But ladies and gentlemen, but would you worship the gift or would you worship the giver of the gift? 
Stewardship reminds us of that essential truth that it is okay to have wealth. But we must never worship our wealth. We must worship the giver of the wealth. Money has no life. It's dead. God, He is life. Yesterday, today, forever. Money, it has limited value. We'll never forget, June last year, I was in the city of Bogota in Colombia. I just finished a session teaching the pastors. This was on a Friday morning, as I recall. And I went back to my hotel room to be prepared for a big rally on the Sabbath. So I turned on the TV just to catch up what is happening around the world. And as I turned on the TV at that time, I think it was about two in the afternoon, at least in Bogota, checking on CNN. And, and as I opened up the TV, checking the news, and had an anchor, news anchor, and then there was kind of a flashing red light at the bottom of the screen, breaking news. Then the anchor spoke, Michael Jackson is dead. You know the story. Died bankrupt. His millions of dollars did not save him. Money has limited value. It'll buy you bread and vegetables and fruits and clothes. God, on the other hand, he is of eternal value. I ask you the question this morning as God's people, whom are you worshiping? Money or God? Here's the truth. For those who are able to read, others who are writing, make sure you get it. This is a third truth. Let's read together. Spiritual worship is an attitude of the heart. It's about commitment Allegiance or loyalty, service, and love for God. I mean, why are you here this morning? Because you love God. Why are you here this morning? Because you are committed to God. Why are you here this morning? Because you want to serve God. It's an attitude of the heart. It's a state of the mind. Stewardship is about worshiping the Creator. Now, as you proceed towards the end of chapter 6, remember we're just looking for about verse 19 to 34. As you proceed towards the end, Jesus looks at the faces of the disciples and there's something that we have in common as humans, and that is we worry. So he looks at the faces. You could see that they were concerned about life. And so he said to them, verse 26, why are you worried about food? What are you worried about the substance, the substance of life? It was springtime, remember? And he saw the birds flying by. And he said, look, look at the birds of the air. They don't catch a taxi or catch the metro to the office. They don't catch a bus to the factory. But God provides for the breakfast, the lunch, and the dinner, the morning tea and afternoon tea and the supper. Why worry if God is able to provide for these little things of creation? Don't you think that He can provide for you? Why worry? As He speaks, women disciples came through and Looked at the women, and women like to have beautiful sari and beautiful clothes. And that is okay. Good to have nice clothes. I got to tell you, every time I see Indian women in the sari, I said, very graceful, very nice. But then he said to them, why do you worry about your clothes? Why do you worry about taking care of the body? And then he looked again to the field and, and saw those wildflowers and 
then he, he went back to the history and said, not even King Solomon in his glory wore anything so beautiful such as what you see here in the field. Look at the combination of colors. Never did. If God is able to provide for the grass and the wildflowers of the field, don't you believe that he can provide for you, said Jesus to the disciples. I told you that the Sermon on the Mount is about practical Christianity. So he said, don't worry. Firstly, he said, don't worry because it will give you stomach ulcer. So worrying is not healthy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Again, I'm looking at verse 32. Don't worry because if you do, then you're not a believer. You're not a follower of a Jesus. You're a pagan. Pretty really strong words. But this is Jesus speaking. Let me ask you to take note of two things that Jesus wanted the disciples and the multitude to get in terms of worry. Two things. And we Adventists ought to learn from this. Number one. Practical things. Don't worry about things that you cannot control. Folks, if we're going to be too serious about what we hear and see around us, the papers, television, we will go nuts. We will. But many of those things are beyond our control. Yes, there is a war in uh, Afghanistan and Still fighting in different parts of Iraq. There are political tensions in East Africa. Also in Asia, Korea. Good to be aware. But many of those, these things are beyond our control. Don't worry about it. It will make you sick. Second thing that Jesus is saying that we ought not to worry about. And I'm talking to you as Seventh-day Adventists this morning. You see, sometimes our unique understanding of prophecy and the end times makes us worry. So we worry about the Sunday law, the enforcement of the Sunday law, and all these kinds of stuff. We need to take a step back from our prophetic charts and our interpretation of prophecies. Listen to what I am going to say. Whether there is a Sunday law or no Sunday law doesn't matter because God is on his throne and he is in control. But why get sick over some of these things that are still in the future and, and, and they may happen or they may not happen, but we're getting sick here in the present, because we are so concerned about that. Live one day at a time. Enjoy life. But don't worry about things of tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And God is on his throne. Truth number four. Write this down. Those of you who are able to read, let's read together. Disciples of Christ, Christian stewards, don't worry. They trust God with all their heart. Worry is the opposite of faith. Are you following me? Worry is the opposite of faith. If you are worrying, then I say, where is your faith? But if you have faith, then I say, why do you worry? You cannot have faith and worry at the same time. And disciples of Christ don't worry because they trust God in everything. They trust God with their future. And even if there's nothing in your bank account, even if there's nothing in the fridge, you can have assurance that Jesus knows 
And he is in control. So don't worry. Trust him with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. This is where we started with a scripture reading, and this is where we'll end. Let me help unpack this very familiar text to many of you. Also see that I have put in bold letters uh, two words, the key words uh, in this verse. Again, this is Matthew 6.33. Let's read together. But to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I will come back and talk to you about kingdom and righteousness. But I want to focus on these three words in English. What are the three words? Talk to me, church. All these things. Emphasis on the all. Are you with me? All. So Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all. All these things. Now, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount and chapter 6 in particular, let me ask a question. What was in Jesus' mind when he used the word all? What was in his mind? Because of my understanding of the context, let me make some suggestions. All these things will include this list. All these things include money. Verse 24. You cannot serve both God and money. It's in the context. And so Jesus, looking at the faces of the disciples, was saying, Is money your concern? Is money your worry? Is money your need? Then seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I... Jesus will provide. No, you didn't hear that. If that is the issue for you in life right now, Jesus is saying, trust me, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In fact, he's not saying, seek first all these things, and then you will have righteousness and the kingdom. Rather, he's saying, seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness, then all those other things will follow. I know that even in, in America and the U.S., there are a lot of poor people and hungry people in the millions. I read something recently, yes, a week ago. It's incredible. It's one of those irony of life in the United States, the, the American dream. The rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. But if that is your need, Jesus said to them, and Jesus is saying to us, seek first the kingdom. Don't go after food first. Seek first the kingdom, and his righteousness, food will come. I will provide. Is it cloves? Shoes for the children. Children ought to have warm clothes for winter. Is it your need? Seek first the kingdom. God's righteousness. The shoes will come. He will provide. It is about health insurance. It's about medication. It's about Children's education at university, costly, costly. If that is your need right now, Jesus said to the disciples, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Tuition for the children will come because I will provide. Is it about security and safety? And one month you think that traveling is safe and then a couple of days after that you're told there are new, new regulations 
it is a pain going through airports. Unfortunately, it's part of my job where I travel probably at least six months of the year going through airports. It's a pain. I enjoy getting to my final destination, but hours at the airport and going through security is a pain. But sometimes the need for security is for your own home. Right in your own home, you're not safe from your husband, your wife, your parents. If that is your need, Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom. Safety will follow. I will provide 24-7. Is it your marriage? On the surface, things may appear to be going well, but at home, it's not. And yet, do you want to have a happy marriage? Seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. God will bring reconciliation, new love and passion to the marriage. I meet uh, couples, many couples, and you know this. This is not a new phenomenon, but in the world there are lots of wonderful couples who would like to have children. Met some of them, prayed with them, loved to have children. For different reasons, they cannot have children. I remember talking to a young professional couple, one of our institutions, and basically said, listen, seek God's will. He will provide. Early this year in March, I was in this country, and the parents of the wife came to me and said, we want to tell you, Tracy, Tracy, our daughter, after 10 plus years of marriage and no children, Tracy is pregnant and expecting their first child. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. God will provide. And then there's plus and plus and plus other things. So Jesus was saying to them, and Jesus is saying to us, you have needs, I know. I know you trust me. But don't go after those things. Seek me first. And all of those things that you need, I will provide. I know. Some of you will say, and I've met many people who have seek God's kingdom and reign in their lives. And yet they're having health issues and challenges. Children are having all kinds of problems. I need to balance out everything that I've said with this one statement. You see, faithfulness to God does not necessarily mean a peaceful life. There are thousands and millions of disciples who are suffering every day, whether it is freedom of worship, whether it is issues with their family, their work, just the basics of life. But here's the point, and if I can take you to some, some of the good shepherd. Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want anything. So even if you don't have a comfortable house in this world, even if you don't have a good car, to travel to worship, even if, if there's tension in, in your marriage, in this world. But if you have Jesus, you have everything. In this world, even if you don't have this comfort of life, though you are faithful to him, if you have Jesus, you have everything. You know the hymn, I would rather have a Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be led by him every day. It's about Jesus. As we look at stewardship, 
I'm coming close to the end of this presentation. Here are some of those issues that Jesus brings to the fore. And I thank this church for honoring this emphasis of the church, this st stewardship Sabbath. Sermon of the Mount, the Mountain Stewardship, it's about God and heaven. Are these your priorities? Stewardship in chapter 6, 5, 6, and 7, it's about the important things of life. Stewardship, it's about the lordship of Jesus and our willingness to surrender to him. Here in this chapter, the issues of stewardship are about faith and a trust. Stewardship, it's about commitment and loyalty to God. It's about allegiance and worship. It's about making disciples and choosing to have a personal relationship with him. That's what stewardship is about. It's a matter of the heart. So let me go back to those two words that I want to highlight as we close. The word kingdom in English comes from the Greek word basileia, which means the rulership, the lordship of Jesus Christ in our hearts. And so when he said, seek first the kingdom, he was not talking of the White House. He was talking about our willingness to let him take control of our lives. Is he the president of your life? Is he the prime minister of your life? Is he the CEO of the CFO? What is Jesus in your life? That's the question. Righteousness. Adventists sometimes talk of their own righteousness because very often we are behavioral oriented. It's about what we do. But in the context of this passage, righteousness is a gift of God. And it, it's, it's a gift of God that comes to us through a right relationship with Him. Let me go back to what I said last night. When the relationship is right, meaning when you're connected to Jesus, right behavior will come naturally. When the relationship is right, the behavior will be right. Our problem very often is a church. We want to do right behavior, thinking that by the right behavior, we will have right relationship wrong. And so when Jesus said, seek first his righteousness, saying, allow me to come into your life. The gift is available. You can have it. But are you willing to take it? Here's the last point as we close. Come back to the heart. Stewardship is not a matter of money. It's not a matter of tithe and offering. It's much more. It's a matter of the heart. It's about our decision whether to make this world our final destination or the other world. Our final stop. But you've got to make up your mind. Are you about the things of this world? Or the things of the other world? Let me close with this truth and a story. So here's principle number five. Are you ready? Let's read together. Stewardship, it's about who is number one in your life. Now let me stop there. Years ago as I was studying at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, 20 minutes from downtown LA, northeast. As a foreign student, I, I alluded to the fact when I was studying in the United States, I, I was on my own. I was not married at the time. I brought in whatever money I had and I had to pay my way through. I was a poor international student, but I was determined. I knew what I wanted to do. And as you know, um, I, I was known both at Loma Linda and at Fuller Theological Seminary, as the cereal man, because that was the cheapest food that I can buy and I can afford to do. You give me cereal, I can eat it in the morning, afternoon, dinner, any time of the night. I'm the cereal man. I love it. Any cereal. I love cereal. Maybe I need to be the Whitbix man. But I remember on occasion I would go to this restaurant, not too far from the campus, a Fuller Theological Seminary. This was my best restaurant at the time for two reasons. Number one, they have the cheapest meals in town. So that's good for me. 
And number two, they serve the best pizza. Now I know, the Italians will disagree with me. I was in Italy in November a couple of years ago and I traversed the country from, uh, from Florence uh, down to, uh, down to uh, Sicily and in between working with our pastors. And I gotta tell you, you know, talk about pizza, well I had pizza, morning, afternoon, dinner. And if it's not pizza, you will eat the pasta. <laughs> no, don't eat the pasta. But here's the story. So my favorite restaurant in Pasadena was this little pizza place. It wasn't Domino or Pizza Hut. And you know, in Southern California, there's lots of people who speak Spanish. Here's the name of this favorite restaurant of mine. I love it. Go there often when I can afford to. This was the name of that restaurant. Numero Uno Pizza. <laughs> For me, if you ask me, even today, I'll tell you that is the place with the best pizza in the world. Stewardship, it's about who is number one in your life. Is it your wife? Is it your son? Is it your house at Clarksville? Is it your car? Who's number one? Continue reading. Stewardship, third line. Stewardship, it's about Jesus as Lord and King of your heart. Stewardship is about having a personal relationship with him. Now, some years ago, I was living in Australia at the time. I was in London, and I went to St. Paul's Cathedral. I'm not sure whether this painting is still inside the cathedral. But I remember when I went in, as you walked into the cathedral, it's a beautiful structure. And over here on the left, uh, you will see this, this painting, massive painting, massive painting. I was told at that time that there are only three copies of this painting in the world. One is what you see inside St. Paul's Cathedral. There's another one in the archive and another one elsewhere. But here's the story. This painting was done by a British painter artist by the name of William Hunt. You see the date when this painting was done. When the painting was completed, and by the way, you see Jesus' right hand knocking on the door. You see that? And his left hand holding a lantern. It's from that lantern where the title of the painting comes from, Jesus, Light of the World. Here's the story. When the painting was completed, Mr. Hunt brought the painting to his students. And he said to them, before this work is taken to the public for exhibition, I want you to look at this work and critique it and tell me if there's anything that I need to do before it's taken out for others to see. Remember, in his time, he was the best. He was a master artist. So I said, please help me. Tell me if there's anything that I need to do to tidy off this work. Well, for, for a few minutes, nobody said a thing. I mean, how can, you, how can you criticize? How can you make an observation of the master himself? Finally, one young man raised his hand and he said, Mr. Hunt, it's a masterpiece. You be very careful when people compliment you because after the compliment, there comes a but. So this young man said, Mr. Hunt, masterpiece, beautiful, but. And he looked to the young man and said, what's the but? He said, sir, as I look at this painting, I see a door, but I don't see the doorknob so that the door can be opened. There was a silence. And Mr. Hunt looked straight him in the face. In front of his students, he said, young man, you're very observant. But the door that you see is not the door of your house. In fact, it's not the door of my house. He looked him in the face again and said, it's the door of your heart and the doorknob is on the inside. 
Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. But the door cannot be opened from the outside. It has to be opened from the inside. Jesus is not going to smash that door down, nor will he try to come through the window. You've got to let him in. Stewardship is having a relationship with Jesus. It's a matter of the heart.